question 1.1 um says a uh, constant net force acts on an object moving in a straight line uh, which one of the following quantities associated with the object will remain constant uh, during the motion so we know that uh, we have a constant force is given in the equation so what's the consequence of a constant force uh, the consequence of a constant force is a uh, constant acceleration. So the answer for point for 1.1 will there be a uh, number C. So uh, 1.2 says uh, the weight of an object on the surface of the earth is W. Uh, these are the interesting equations. Uh, you have to work with variables. What will be the weight of the object on the surface of another planet? Of the same mass as that of the earth uh, but twice the radius of the earth so we know that um, weight uh, equals to mg right uh, the mass of the object remains the same uh, so th is the gravity that is changing uh, gravity uh, is given by uh, capital G which is a constant uh, the mass of the planet uh, divided by uh, the radius of the planet squared, right? Uh, on the question, it is said that uh, the mass is that of the Earth. So this is, uh, let's say, let's name this G Earth. So now let's find G for the new planet, right? So that we can know how the weight will change. Uh, this is equals to, uh, this is a constant. They say that the mass is the same, uh, but then the radius is twice that of the Earth. So here we're going to get um, 2R uh, squared, right? Uh, which gives us uh, G uh, multiplied by mass divided by 4R squared, right? Uh, so now instead of having, um, having uh, G equals to GM uh, divided by R squared, uh, we have G uh, being equals to uh, 1 over 4. Uh, multiply by g m divided by r squared so because weight equals to mg if you reduce g by a factor of four then the weight also goes down by the way factor of four here on 1.2 uh, the option that gives us that is uh, number a so for 1.2 uh, the correct option is letter a uh, 1.3 uh, it says uh, the diagram below shows a cricket player moving his hands down from position A uh, to 2 to 3 while catching uh, while catching a ball okay um, which one of the following statements correctly explains why the cricket player moves his hands downwards oh, okay so a, a cricket player is catching a ball and then as the ball is landing, uh, it's moving the hand down, right? Um, okay, makes sense. Uh, before I read the options, uh, like, it, we know that uh, F net uh, equals to delta P uh, divided by delta T, right? So if you increase the time of contract, you decrease F net, right? So there won't be so much impact if it's a collision or there won't be so much force uh, generally. So if you're catching a ball, it makes sense that you'd wanna, uh, as, long as, as soon as it's landing, you're moving your hand back so that you increase the time of contract and the ball doesn't bounce off and then the force is larger, right? Because if you decrease the time, then the force will go up. So let's go through the options. Um, the impulse on the ball is decreased. Uh, that's A. B it says the change in momentum of the ball is increased. Um, C says the change in momentum of the ball is decreased. And then D says the time it takes to change the momentum uh, of the ball is increased. Uh, which is true because we are increasing uh, the time of contract. So the time it is taken to change the momentum of the ball is increased. So for 1.3, uh, the correct option uh, is D. Um, 1.4 uh, 1.4 says consider the motion of a small stone thrown vertically upwards until it reaches its maximum height. Uh, so we have a stone uh, 
there it is it is thrown up uh, until it reaches its uh, maximum match some v which is close to zero there and then ignore the effects of friction okay so uh we free falling uh which one of the following combinations of graphs correctly shows how the momentum p and the gravitational potential energy u of the stone change with time okay so the formula for p we have um m multiplied by v and then uh, that's momentum and then potential energy we have uh, mass uh, gravity and height so p you can see it's linear so the graph of p must be linear um as velocity increases uh, the magnitude of p increases because the mass is the same so p is uh, basically a variable is basically a function of a velocity so here we're looking for a linear graph for p uh, that is uh, going down because the velocity is uh, going down um a is exponential is exponentially going down so that's wrong and then b is exponentially go is linearly going down so b is a candidate and then c um <laughs> that's not linear and then d uh, is also uh, linearly uh, going down so d is an option and then for you um look at the equation of you the equation of u is a uh, linear so because the equation of uh, u is linear uh, potential energy you might be tempted to say that uh, the correct option is b because um, when you increase the height the potential energy goes up but then the only difference is that in this instance the potential energy is not a function of um, it's not a function of height uh, it's a function of time right uh, so here for p we didn't put uh, the fact that it's a function of time into consideration because velocity itself is a function of time right uh, we have vf uh, equals to vi plus a delta t but then for you uh, that has consequences because okay let's say uh, you're starting at zero right meters and then two meters and then four meters and then six meters right um okay and then let's say you hear at the top and then you drop in a ball down and the time it takes for the ball to go from here to here is not the same as the time it takes from the ball to go from here to here because for every second the the velocity of the ball is increasing by 9.8 so let's say here it took like um let's say it took uh one second uh yeah it's probably gonna take like uh, 0 0.5 seconds uh just less than uh, so to say in a way so um you can see that uh potential energy uh, decreases uh exponentially uh with time uh with height it decreases linearly but then with time it decreases exponentially uh, but then in this case uh, it is increasing right because uh, the ball has been thrown up so the right option is option um it's option d yeah because uh on option d uh we are uh, the potential energy is increasing because the ball is going up so the answer here is d uh, this is a very tricky question because um initially you'd think that it's b because u equals to m multiplied by gravity multiplied by height height is not squared so it should just be linear but then it's you know sort of a bit more complicated than that yeah um let's move ahead uh 1.5 uh, 1.5 says a boy and a girl having different masses are uh, initially addressed at point P. They slide down at uh, different paths of a water slide as shown in the diagram below. Ignore the effects of air friction. And then the options one says, okay, let's uh, let, let, let's read the, the the options. Uh, the first option says uh, the only. Uh, the only thing that's true about uh, about uh, the boy and the girl it's a uh, roman figure one a uh, roman figure one says only conservative forces act on both 
uh, the boy and the girl where they are sliding downwards. Okay, the question said let's ignore um let's ignore free effects of friction. So uh, that is correct, right? Uh, so I is correct. Uh, <laughs> Roman figure one. Okay, so in A uh, we have Roman figure one. So Roman figure one. So A is still a still a possible answer, and then B is also a possible answer. Um, C is not a possible answer because it doesn't have a uh, Roman figure one. And Roman figure one, we say that is correct. And then uh, D is a Roman figure one, so it's also still a possible answer. Then uh, for Roman figure two, says uh, the boy and the girl each have the same gravitational potential energy at point P. Uh, but if you come and read the question, it says a boy and a girl having different masses and uh, above we were saying that uh, u uh, potential energy m gravity height so if the masses are different then uh, they have the same height they are on the same uh, body so their gravity is the same the gravity that uh, is being applied onto them is the same so uh, roman figure number two is not correct because they have different masses so all the options that have Roman figure number two are going to fall off. D has Roman figure number two, so it's not correct. Um, so now the only left option is A and a B. Uh, B uh, then Roman figure number three says, on reaching point Q, the speed of the girl is equal to that of the boy. The speed of the girl is equal to that of the boy. Okay, that is that is correct. So the option, the correct option here is, is B. Let me tell you why the speed of uh, the boy is equal to that uh, of the girl. Um, is <laughs> the answer is because of Roman figure number one. Roman figure number one says only conservative forces. So if a force is conservative, then the work done by that force is independent of path. That means that the work uh, net uh, which is equal to change in kinetic energy is gonna be the same, right? Um, these two people are coming from from rest, so that means that uh, okay, let's say so we have one over two m v f squared uh, minus zero because initially they're from rest, right? So they have the same velocity because they have the same work. The forces acting on them are conservative forces the work done by conservative forces is independent of path thank you um let's move ahead 1.6 1.66 an astronomer observes uh, that the light spectrum on a star has been blue shifted um if we have a blue shift we know that uh, the frequency uh, increased uh, the wavelength uh, went down and the distance uh, between the two also went down right so let's say uh, why is the dis let's just say r r is the distance so this is what we know about a blue shift and then uh, it goes on to say how have the observed frequency of light from the star and the distance between the star and the earth changed the frequency we already said that it's increased so from a a, B, C, D. Uh, D is not a candidate anymore. C is not a candidate anymore. So the only question, uh, we're only choosing between A and B now. And then, uh, the other, the other information is the distance between the star and the earth. Uh, A, C is increased and then B, C is decreased. Uh, we know that, uh, for a blue shift to occur, the distance need to have, uh, reduced, right? And then, so the answer for uh, 1.6 is option B. Uh, let's move ahead. Uh, 1.7. 1.7 says a small negative point charge Q is situated halfway between two identical spheres, P and Q, identical. So they have the same charge, they have the same mass, um, they have the same everything basically. And then, uh, sphere P exists an electrostatic force of magnitude F. So F of P, uh, let's call this a uh, key on sphere, on sphere Q, uh, P exists an electrostatic force of magnitude F on sphere Q. What is the magnitude of the net force experienced by point charge 
uh, the point charge is is halfway is halfway right so if p uh, is exerting some force uh, k then q will be exerting uh, some force okay if this is uh, if if this point charge is positive then p will be pushing it that way and then q because it's identical will be pushing it and uh, that way will be repelling right so this will be minus q and then if uh, the point charge is negative then the same is still true uh, p will be pulling it and then q uh, will also be pulling it so the effect of p is neutralized by the effect of q so the net uh, so the, the magnitude of the net electrostatic, electrostatic force explained uh, experienced by the point charge is thus zero so for 1.7 and the option is uh, number A. And then um, 1.8. 1.8 says uh, consider the statements below regarding AC power and DC power. Uh, Roman figure one. Okay, so let's do it the way we did that. Uh, so we have option A, uh, B, C, D. Uh, Roman figure one says AC, uh, AC voltage uh, can be changed during ac power uh, transmission yeah that is that is true uh the voltage can be changed that is why uh it's safer to use ac over dc and then ac is the one that is commonly used now so everything that has even that doesn't have roman figure one falls apart a has a roman figure one still a candidate b is gone um uh, c is still still in the game and then uh d is gone so um uh so so we can basically uh ignore a roman figure two uh because the only possible um the only possible answers is a or c and then they all don't have figure a roman figure two so um let's look at roman figure three ac power transmission is more energy um efficient yeah that is true so uh the option here is uh c so c uh is the answer and then a uh, falls apart is also wrong yeah ac voltage uh can be changed uh ac is more efficient even just because of that because the voltage can be changed it makes it more efficient so for 1.10 uh we have a question saying uh some of the energy levels of an atom are represented in the diagram below. Uh, there we have uh, the, the ground level, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. And then the question says, uh, which of the following energy transitions uh, below represents the absorption of light of the lowest frequency uh, by the atom? So um, if, if, okay, let's say you have, e1 and then you have e2 and then you have uh, e3 and then uh, you have e4 uh, if uh, there is a big uh, a bigger uh, gap uh, between these energy levels uh, then the energy uh, is small so if the energy is small uh, the frequency is more right so if you're looking for the lowest frequency then you're looking for the uh, smallest energy uh, which uh, of, of these options uh, from from a ground state to f to the fourth energy level uh, that's a big jump that's the greatest from the first to the third that's a bit smaller from the third uh, to the fourth uh, that looks like the smallest so the option here uh, 1.10 is uh, is d um, so let's look at the equation we have here uh, it says an 8 kg block on a rough horizontal surface is connected to a 2 kg block by a light inextensible string passing over a frictionless pulley. As shown below, the 8 kg block moves at a constant speed. Um, so when we hear constant speed, uh, we know that um, the acceleration uh, is equal to 0 uh, meter per second squared, right? Uh, so this implies that um, the F net acting is equal to zero um, and then it goes on to say when uh, pulled by a 29.6 newton horizontal force to the right uh, the frictional force acting on the akg 
block is 10 newton uh, there we have it uh, the first question says uh, state newton's second law in terms of motion um, assuming that you already uh, know what that is so i'm just going to move on uh, we have 2.2 2.2 says uh, draw a labeled free body diagram for the 8 kg block uh, so if you have went through questions like this i'd advise you to pause and then do the question by yourself and then you then watch me do it um, so uh, the free body diagram on the 8 kg block okay there we have the 8 kg block uh, it's lying on the horizontal surface uh, because it's lying on a surface and uh, the surface is exerting a normal force upright yeah so there we have it and then uh, gravitational force is always acting yeah so we're gonna have uh, fg or w for weight uh, whatever you want to call it and then uh, we have our force uh, that is being applied there of uh, 29.6 newton so i'm gonna put that there and then um they say that friction is acting uh, so we're gonna have um fr and then it is also it's it's connected to a 2 kg uh block through a string so we have uh tension right so i'm just gonna put it there so yeah there we have it uh, those are the forces acting on the 8 kg block um the tension and the frictional is equal to the f that is being applied right and thus it is moving at a, a constant speed like like they stated um so let's carry on uh, let's move ahead uh says um 2.3 calculate the tension in the string um so let's look at the 8 kg block uh, so let's say 8 kg block um i'm not choosing 8 kg the 8 kg block because it's uh, the one i like the most uh, 8 is not my favorite number i'm choosing it uh, i'm just trying it out i will write all the given information for the 8 kg block and then see if i get to the answer if i don't get to the answer i'll then use the 2 kg block so I'm not choosing the 8 kg block because I like it so much. But then usually in questions like this, if you have a 2.1, the answer for 2.1 uh, helps you answer 2.2 and the one from 2.2 help you answer 2.3. So because 2.2 uh, says at uh, the free body diagram of the 8 kg block, it's most likely that uh, 2.3 you will be using the 8 kg block. But then let's just go ahead and see. So um the law we're sticking to is newton's second law of motion obviously so we're gonna have f net um okay f net uh, equals to mass uh, multiplied by acceleration and then uh, we also know that f net is equals to uh the first force uh, the second force and then um some force n right so what are the forces acting on the horizontal on the 8 kg block we know that uh, from 2.2 .2, we have the force applied and uh, we have the tension and then we have the friction so if we uh, write that down we're gonna have uh, this force which is being applied uh, plus the tension force uh, plus the frictional force uh, equals to um, 8 kg multiplied by zero right uh, because that is uh we have an acceleration of zero because it is moving at constant speed so what is f f is given to us is 29.6 uh what is t uh t is our our variable of interest so there we have t there and then plus uh, friction right uh friction opposes the motion uh, it's opposing the motion like the tension so we're gonna put a negative value there. It says that the frictional force is 10 newton, so we're gonna have minus 10 uh, equals to zero, right? So 29.6 minus 10, uh, that is 19.6. So we're gonna have 19.6 uh, plus t equals to zero. Uh, take 19.6 to the other side, you get uh, t equals to minus 19.6. Six um, newton, uh, which makes sense because t is opposing the motion, so it's supposed to have a negative value. Um, so let's move ahead. Uh, for two point four, they say that uh, the force we have is now increased to uh, fifteen newton, right? So uh, we're gonna have f 
equals to 15 newton and then there we have it and 2.4.1 uh, uh, 2.4 says apply Newton second law to each block and calculate the uh, 2.4.1 then says a magnitude of the acceleration of the 8 kg block uh, okay so let's start with the 8 kg block and see if we can get and uh, the acceleration using the 8 kg block only and then if we cannot then we'll then involve the 2 kg block but then let's start with the 8 kg block uh, so the 8 kg block uh, we're sticking to the basics. Uh, we know that F net uh, equals to MA. Uh, this is equals to uh, the, all, the sum of all the forces acting on the object. Uh, so from F1 to some FN, uh, N being any number of the forces we have. So uh, F1, uh, the force being applied, uh, 15 Newton. Uh, there we have it. And then uh, we have tension opposing. Uh, so we have uh, minus minus t and then we have um, the frictional force which is said to be 10 newton right uh, so that is uh, minus uh, 10 um, and then it goes to 8 uh, multiplied by acceleration right um, um, and then okay two point okay and then this will be our equation one because now we have two variables right so we need another equation if you have three variables you make sure you get three equations if you have four you get four equations and then you can solve so another uh, <coughs> equation will get it by using the 2 kg block uh, the question sort of gives it away because it says apply Newton's second law to each block but then even if it doesn't say that if you're trying to find acceleration and tension and then you find yourself in a situation where you have two variables you have to use the other mass or the other block the other whatsoever to find the second equation and then you can solve simultaneously so let's go ahead uh, for the 2 kg block uh, for the 2 kg block um, there's two forces acting at uh, the tension and gravity so um, we're gonna have uh, the tension uh, uh, minus uh, gravity uh, which is equals to ma right um, the mass is 2 kg, so let me just go ahead and put 2 and then that's been multiplied by A, which we don't know what it is and then our T equals to uh, minus uh, FG is the mass multiplied by 9,8, right? so there we have it, uh, this is equals to uh, 2A so we're going to have T uh, minus 19.6 equals to uh, 2A uh, this is our equation uh, 2 uh, some people like complicating their lives. Uh, they, 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 they want to solve this simultaneously by making t the subject of the formula and then substitute on the other equation. But then the way I like doing it is like on the first equation, uh, look at this part. We have minus t, right? And then on the second equation, we have t. So if you add these two equations, t is going to disappear. And then you're gonna actually it's not gonna going to disappear that's technically wrong uh, they're going to cancel out so you're gonna be left with only a and then you can just solve for acceleration so let me practice what i preach uh, so equation two plus equation one uh, will give you so i'm adding two to one uh, so i'm gonna have uh, 50 uh, minus t uh, minus 10 uh, plus um okay let me yeah and then t uh, minus 19.6 uh, and then that's it it goes to 8a uh, plus um 2a um this is equation uh, one and then i'm adding a uh, equation uh two okay um so t and t are going to uh, cancel out like you see so here on this side i'm gonna be left with i'm gonna be left with uh 50 uh, minus 10 uh, minus 19.6 plus to uh 10a uh this implies that um a equals to uh 50 uh, minus 10 minus 19.6 uh, divided by 10. Uh, let me put that into my calculator real quick. So 50 minus 10 will give you 40. 
uh, minus 9,6 uh, minus 19,6 and divided by 10 and then I'm getting an acceleration of uh, 2.04 uh, meters per second um, squared yeah so th there you have it uh, that's how you solve this problem uh, let's carry on uh, last but not least uh, 2.4.2 say it's complete the tension uh, in, the in the string uh, we have uh, this equation one here um, there you have it and then we have this equation two here and then we're supposed to find uh, acceleration so we can just sub in at the t we found on 2.4.1 in any of these equations um, the second equations looks a bit um, simple it's, it's easy on the i it doesn't look as complicated as the first one so let's sub uh, t on the second equation so we have uh, t uh, minus 19,6 equals to 2a. So t equals to 2. We're saying that a is 2.04, right? And then we add 19.6. Um, um, let me put that in my calculator real quick. Um, 2 multiplied by 2.04 uh, plus 19,6. Uh, that gives me uh, 23.68 uh, uh, Newton and that's it for this um, for this problem. Uh, we're done with it. Uh, make sure you subscribe. I'm going to post other questions uh, from this question paper. Uh, the May June uh, from 2021. Question 3 on vertical projectile motion. Um, the question says a ball of mass 0 0.06 kg so let me just go ahead and write that down. So we have our M. Um, we have our M, uh, which is 0 0.06 kg. Uh, it's thrown vertically upwards from the balcony of a building three meters above the ground. Um, okay. The ball reaches a maximum height H above the ground as shown in the diagram below. Um, hopefully you can see the diagram on the left hand side uh, and then it says ignore the effects of everything um, that's what we always do and then 3.1 uh, it says name the force acting on the ball while it is in free fall um, if an object is in free fall uh, the only force acting is weight right or you might want to call it a uh, gravitational force yeah whatever floats your boat in that way so there we have it a uh, gravitational force and then um, the velocity time graph uh, below represents the motion of the ball from the instant it is thrown upwards until it hits the ground okay um, so let's do a bit of analysis of this VT graph uh, just to see what I was regarded as positive. Uh, did they regard up as positive or down as positive when they sketched this VT graph? Um, so uh, it's thrown up from a certain with a certain velocity, and then that velocity uh, keeps on decreasing, right? And then our graph uh, also keeps on decreasing, and then at the maximum height, uh, V zero, so at time one point zero two. And then after that is going down and then uh, the the graph is below the x-axis so they took up as positive uh, that's an important thing to 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 realize uh, and then question 3.2 says uh, write down the acceleration of the ball at time t equals to 1.02 seconds uh, the acceleration is um 9.8 meters per uh, second squared right but then this is more of a trick question uh they're trying to see if you really know vertical projectile motion because you can see there at t uh, it goes to 1.02 seconds um the the vt graph uh, it cuts the x-axis so the velocity is zero so if you don't really know your story and then you see in that it, uh, it it cuts the graph and then you have velocity of zero some people might be tempted to say the acceleration is zero uh, just because you know you don't really 
no vertical projectile motion like that uh, but then the thing is uh, the acceleration of the ball is always 9.8 meter per second squared regardless of what the velocity is and what's going on on that motion um, so let's move ahead we have 3.3 3.3 says um, consider the areas a1 and a2 uh, they, they are they are denoted there on the graph uh, shown in the graph above write down the numerical value uh, represented uh, by the difference in areas a1 and a2 so um, let's look at area a1 right um, area a1 is a triangle so um, we are going to have a uh, half uh, base multiplied by height right and then so it's just gonna be half of uh, the velocity uh, multiplied by uh, the time and then a2 uh we have the same one over two base by height uh, one over two the velocity uh, multiplied by the time uh, but then the thing to realize here is that you're multiplying a uh, velocity with time and uh, distance uh, equals to uh velocity multiplied by time right or this can also be speed so uh, the the difference between area two and area one uh, is the it is the difference in the distance covered right so area one is from uh, when the ball is thrown uh, to the maximum height right and then area two is from a uh, maximum height uh, to the ground so what we are interested in is this portion here this portion and the question says that um uh, that uh, the where the ball is thrown from is three meters above the ground right so the difference between area one and area two uh, will give you uh, three meters that's how uh, the question is interpreted um let's move ahead 3.4 3.4 uh, point one says calculate um speed at which uh, the ball is thrown upwards so okay we're going to regard uh, only the part of the motion from when the ball is thrown from the balcony uh, to the maximum height why am i regarding uh, only this part of the motion because at the maximum height we have a uh, free information uh, in that way i'm just saying we have vf equals to zero at maximum height so that is information we're getting for free and then we also have a equals to uh, minus 9.8 meters per uh, second squared i'm um, taking up as positive right so that's why acceleration is negative uh, so here we have to find uh, vi and then we know from the VT graph, we know that at the maximum height, uh, T is equal to 1.02 uh, seconds. So we have this, we have this, we have this, we are looking for this. So what we do, we only have uh, four equations of interest in vertical projectile. We'll look for an equation that has this given, uh, these variables we have, and then VI and then we can use that to calculate vi you will realize that that is vf equals to vi plus a uh, delta t uh, vf is zero we already know that because we're regarding the motion from the balcony to the maximum height and then uh, vi is our unknown a, a is minus 9.8 uh, multiplied by 1.02 so um vi equals to uh, 9.8 uh, multiplied by 1.02 uh, which is equals to uh, let me put that in the kind of literal kick and uh, 9.996 meters per second yeah so um there we have it uh, we have our vi um let's move ahead says so uh 3.4.2 says uh calculate the height of h right so okay here i'm going to take um 
you can see that uh, from the ground to the balcony is three meters right so from a uh, balcony uh, to maximum height uh, we're going to have uh, some distance covered right and then that distance covered uh, plus the three meters uh, will be equals to our height so um, i'm taking i'm regarding that motion again the motion from the balcony to the maximum height to calculate uh, the distance the ball covers from the balcony to the maximum height then when i add uh, the three meters i'm gonna get um i'm gonna get uh, the height right so i have vf uh which is zero i have vi uh which is nine comma nine nine six uh, meters per second i have g uh, which is minus uh, nine comma eight uh, meters per second squared and then what else do i have i have t uh, which is equals to uh, 1.02 seconds um okay we have the equation uh, vf squared equals to vi squared plus 2a uh, delta y yeah this equation yeah seems to work so we're gonna go ahead and use it um apart from this equation there's also uh delta y equals to vi delta t uh plus one over two a delta t squared so basically here yeah, we can use this equation or we can use this one because uh we all have delta y there and then vi and vf we have them and then the acceleration it's always given so um let me choose the second one because the second one i won't have to uh, make delta y the subject of the formula uh even if you know it's not that complicated um so okay delta y equals to vi uh we determine it to be nine comma nine nine six and then delta t is one comma zero two uh plus one over two acceleration is minus nine comma eight and then uh, delta t is one comma zero two uh let me put that in my calculator real quick and see uh what i'm getting so nine comma nine nine six I multiply by 1 comma 0 2 uh, plus 1 over 2 multiply by 9 by minus 9 comma 8 uh, multiply by 1 comma 0 2 uh, that is giving me uh, 5.1979 uh, meters right uh, so this would imply that h equals to 3 plus uh, 5 comma 1979 uh, which is um eight comma one nine seven nine uh, meters uh, so what you can do here uh, you can try using uh, the other the other the other equation uh, this equation that we have here um here it is and see if you get uh, the same answer so that is nine comma nine six modulo over one comma okay um i think that's correct uh let's move ahead uh 3.5 uh last but not least it has six marks so as soon as i see six marks i just assume that i'm going to do a lot of work it says calculate um okay uh, there's some information given after eating the ground the ball bounces red color upwards and reaches a, maxi a new maximum height in 1.16 uh, six seconds so from a uh, ground uh, to new max right uh, we take in 1.1 seconds so the ball is thrown from the balcony it comes down and then it reaches uh, some new height right i don't know if the new height is above the balcony or it's below the balcony but from uh, this point to this point uh, they're saying that we take 1.1 seconds yeah that's what they say um and then the question says i'll uh, calculate uh, the work done by the ground on the ball while the ball is in contact uh, with um with the ground okay so yeah what net uh it's because you uh, the change in 
EK rush. And then the work done by nine higher conservative forces is uh, changing EK uh, plus changing EP. And then our work net is also equals to work one plus work two, uh, blah, 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 and so on. But then if you pay attention here, uh, the information we have uh, or that which you can extract is the is the kind of, is the velocity at which it is the ground and the velocity at which uh, it leaves uh, the ground and with that said uh, it means that we're gonna have to use one between uh, the two equations that has a kinetic energy right so okay let's uh, go ahead and do that so we're gonna have um so now we're supposed to find a velocity at which uh, we hit at the ground right and the ball is the ground and then the velocity at which uh, we leave the ground at least the ground right so if we take the motion from uh, the maximum height uh, until it reaches the ground so we're gonna have okay so Okay, VF is what you are interested in. Uh, we have VI, uh, which is zero, right? Um, and then A, we have it, obviously. And then we don't have T, uh, but we have Y, right? So we're going to look uh, for the equation that has four of those variables. And then our, our VF. A variable of interest will be uh, the unknown. So the equation that has all that is uh, VF squared equals to VI squared plus 2A delta Y. Uh, the reason why I don't have to look at any place uh, to to find this information is because uh, to, to choose an equation is because I've been doing this for so long. So when I see given information, uh, the equation that I need to use comes to my head automatically. I don't have to think about it. So, um, if you getting surprised, oh, how am I getting all this kind of stuff? Uh, it's just skin in the game. I spend more time solving these problems uh, every now and then, and then eventually uh, you'll get used to it. So, VF squared is our variable of interest, and then VI squared uh, is at zero right at the velocity at the maximum height and then plus two a is minus nine comma eight and then uh delta y is at the height which you calculated um 8.1979 let's take that as uh 8.2 so it's gonna be it's gonna be minus 8.2 uh, because we're starting from the maximum uh, going down uh, and then we took up as positive so down is negative so if I put this in a calculator, I uh, get, let me do that real quick, 2 multiplied by negative 9,8 multiplied by negative 8.2. I'm getting 160.72 uh, uh, square roots on both sides. And uh, that gives me 160.72. That gives me... A uh, velocity final of 12.6775 uh, um, meters uh, per second, right? Um, so I have uh, the V uh, at which we uh, strike uh, the ground, right? Now we're supposed to find the V at which uh, we leave the ground. So the V at which we leave the ground, we're going to regard the motion from when we leave the ground uh, to the maximum height. So here we're gonna have a VI, and then um, we're gonna have uh, the time it takes. At the time you say that it's um, 1.1 seconds, so we have this, this is our unknown. And then at the maximum height, uh, this is known, it is zero, right? Zero meters per second. And then, um, yeah, we have A. So if you have this variable, uh, the equation to use is 
um, vf equals to vi uh, plus a uh, delta t uh, so vf uh, will be equals to um, actually our vf is zero at the maximum height so what we can get in is uh, vi and then plus uh, minus 9,8 uh, multiplied by 1.1 uh, seconds uh, so uh, let me put that in the calculator uh, we're going to have a vi of uh, 9,8 multiplied by 1,1 which is 10.78 so we have uh, the mass of the object and then we have uh, the vi which is equals to uh, 12 comma 6775 and then we have the vf uh, which is what we calculated right now uh, let me write it here and uh, this is 10.78 uh, meters per second so um if we have these three variables uh, the equation to use is uh, work net equals to uh, delta ek right uh, so this will give you one over two 0 0.06 kg and then our uh, vf uh, that is uh, 10.78 uh, squared right uh, minus 12.6775 um, squared so if i put that in the calculator i get uh, let me do that real quick uh 10.78 squared minus uh, 12.6775 squared uh, I get uh, minus 1.3353 joules uh, for so for this question uh, this will be the answer um, question 4 says a simple rocket system consists of two parts um, a of mass 3m so let me jot that down so we have a and then the same that the mass is uh, 3m uh, kg or some unit and then b of mass 2m so we have b uh, which is mass of uh, 2m uh, kg or some unit i'm not so sure as shown in the diagram as shown in the diagram below uh, b is stacked on top of a and if you look on the left hand side there it is um before the collision uh, b is on top of a and then after the collision a is going down and then b keeps on going up i'm assuming um 4.1 says uh state the principle of conservation of momentum in words uh, that is just uh, the total uh, linear momentum in an isolated system is conserved right um the sum of uh, momentum before is equals to the sum of momentum after in an isolated system and then uh, 4.2 uh, says the rocket is traveling vertically upward at a constant speed v so let me write that down a uh, when it's with b uh, their velocity um, let me write that down the velocity is 1 divided by 3 uh, v uh, no it's actually the velocity is v i'm sorry uh, when an internal uh, explosion causes a to move downwards at a speed one divided by three v so uh, there's a explosion an internal explosion and now a is moving uh, downwards at v equals to one divided by three v right and then for b uh, we don't know what is going on and then uh the question says okay ignore all external forces on the rocket uh, the question now says calculate the velocity of b in terms of v immediately immediately after the internal uh, explosion so this is our uh, scenario let me get it this is our scenario uh, before the explosion and then this is what we have after the explosion so this uh, momentum here before is supposed to be equals to this momentum here after that's what uh, 
the conservation of momentum states that are the sum of the momentum before is equal to the sum of the momentum after if the system is isolated or is closed and then the question says ignore all the forces on the rocket so that tells us that uh, the, uh, the system is closed okay so um, before uh, the masses are together right so that will be um m of a body a plus m of body b and then they're traveling at the same velocity and uh, that's what the equation states and then after uh they saying that a goes down so we'll have m uh a the mass of a and then uh, the velocity of a which we are given and uh, now that uh, they've exploded they're no longer together so the masses are apart so we're going to have the mass of B and then uh, the velocity of B. Uh, the mass of A uh, is said to be uh, 3M. So we're going to put 3M uh, plus the mass of B, which is uh, 2M. And then the velocity is just given as V. So that's exactly what we're going to have. Uh, the mass of A, we already said that is 3M. And then the velocity of M is 1 over 3 v but then uh, i want you to realize that um a is going down and common sense <laughs> says we always take up as positive if you take down as positive that's fine but then to me it doesn't make sense up is positive so because a is going down instead of one over three v i'm going to put minus one over three v right um minus one over three uh, v plus m of b is 2 meters so oh, it's 2m i'm sorry uh, so we're gonna have uh, 2m uh, multiplied by uh, the velocity which we are interested in so that's what we are supposed to find so 3m plus uh, 2m will give you 5m then multiply by v that's 5mv right uh, that's our left hand side of the equation then 3m multiplied by minus 1 over 3v and uh, that will give you a uh, minus 1v right so, uh, minus 1mv right uh, because this 3 here on the denominator is gonna cancel out with this 3 and then uh, plus 2m um, v Let, let's denote this as v of b so that we don't confuse uh, our variable v with uh, the v of b we're trying to determine so the next step is to take uh, this term here uh, to the left hand side so that we can isolate v of b uh, so we're gonna have when it goes to the other side it's gonna change its sign obviously so we're gonna have 6 um, m v equals to 2 m v of b uh, we divide both sides by uh, by 2m so that we can isolate v of b divided by 2m um, yeah we're gonna be left with 3 here because 6 divided by 2 is 3 right so this will imply that <coughs> v of <coughs> v of uh, the body b is equals to uh, 3v uh, the question says uh, we must find it in terms of v so that is what we're going to find so it's 3v upwards uh, because uh, we're taking up as positive um that's that's how we do the problem um it's not really complicated apart from the fact that uh, now we have a vertical uh, we're working on the vertical and usually on momentum and impulse you're working on you're working on the horizontal uh, but then apart from that it's just straightforward uh, the masses are, are joined initially and then after that uh, they're separated so uh, for ep before you're going to uh, add the masses and have one velocity and then for ep after uh, you're going to have the separate masses with the different velocities um yes i think i should do a, a separate introductory video on momentum and impulse um so 
you can let me know in the comment if yeah that's something you'd be interested in so if we move ahead we have 4.3 uh, which says um, the graph below shows the average force exerted by A on B during the internal explosion uh, as a function of time um, and then, there we have it on the y-axis we have average force and then on the x-axis we have time uh, the equation says name the physical quantity uh, represented uh, by the area under the graph um, so to calculate the area under the graph you have to multiply uh, the length uh, by the breadth right uh, uh, assuming that the length is going up, then it means you're going to have force, uh, the average force. Uh, so force average uh, multiplied by uh, the time, right? Uh, but then the time doesn't start at zero. So it's it's basically a delta T because you have some time initial and some time final. And then which quantity is given by F average multiplied by delta T? Uh, that is delta P, right? So the physical quantity represented uh, by the area under the graph is um, impulse uh, change in momentum. So that is coming from the formula. So this is what the equation is asking for, right? So that is coming from the formula F net uh, equals to delta P uh, divided by um, delta T. Um, so let's move ahead. Uh, 4.4 it says uh, redraw the graph in your answer book on the same set of axes. Uh, sketch the graph on the average. Uh, sketch the graph of the average force that x that b exists on a as a function of time. Uh, so let me just put in an axis there. So there's our y. Uh, there's our x, and then so we have force average. And then we have time in seconds, right? And then that's um, that's F A on B, right? The equation says find F B on A. Uh, Newton's third law says that if body A exerts a force on body B, body B will exert a force on body A of equal magnitude but then in the opposite direction so because this graph is on top of the x axis we're just supposed to draw uh, the same thing but then below the x axis uh, so that uh, the force has a negative sign right equal magnitude but um, opposite direction so these two are supposed to be equal this part and this part um, and that's it for this question uh, question 5 says a demolition ball is used by crane to break the wall of a building the demolition ball of mass so we have a mass there let me just uh, write it down a mass of uh, 1250 kgs um, is lifted uh, by the crane to a point r at a height of 5.8 meters so we have a height of 5.8 uh, meters above its lowest position in 60 seconds uh, so we have some time t of um 60 seconds uh ignore air friction okay and then the first question uh 5.1 says i uh, define the term power in words so uh power the full number of power is given as work uh, divided by uh, delta t uh, so from this formula you can define power as the rate at which work is done right uh, 5.2 says calculate the average power dissipated by the crane in lifting the demolition ball to point r um so okay the average power dissipated by the crane in lifting the demolition ball to point r uh, the height is from to point R is 5.8 meters, right? We have already wrote that down. And then, okay, power average is given as uh, force uh, multiplied by uh, velocity average. So what this question wants us to do is to determine uh, the force 
determine the velocity average and then we have the power average so uh, the domain knowledge of a crane is that it moves at constant speed or constant velocity it doesn't accelerate or decelerate at any point of the motion so what that means is that um, the forces when the ball is moving up are balanced because it's hanging we don't have normal force frictional force or any of that the only force that's acting on the ball apart from the force exerted by the crane is force of gravity so that is to say um f crane uh, is equals to uh, minus f g right because these forces are balancing out and then uh, the demolition ball is moving at constant speed so that is equals to minus uh mass multiplied by gravity and then the mass is uh the mass we already have it is minus Oh, it's actually not minus. The mass is 1,250 kg. And then force of gravity, uh, minus 9,8, right? And then uh, the minuses uh, will give you a positive. And now, um, let me put that in the calculator and see what I get. Uh, 1,250 multiplied by 9,8. Uh, that is uh, 12,200 and... Um, 50 uh, newtons right and then now what's left is velocity average um, we know from grade 10 that uh, distance is given by speed multiplied by time so if you make speed the subject of the formula you get distance uh, divided by time the same is true about the velocity so in this instance our distance is the height right so we're going to have height and then the time is the time uh, is the 60 seconds we have there so this will give us uh, 5.8 uh, meters divided by 60 seconds um, seconds right if we put that back into the our equation we'll get a uh, power average uh, equals to um, 12,250 multiplied by 5.8 uh, divided by 60. Uh, if I put that in the calculator, I get uh, 12,250 uh, multiplied by 5.8 meters divided by 60 seconds. Um, that gives me uh, 1,184.1 uh, uh, recurring uh, joules per second or watts right um let's move ahead that was that was 5.2 let's move to 5.3 uh there's some more information given that says uh, the demolition ball is released from point r and strikes the wall at the lowest point of its swing the ball then moves 0 0.25 meters horizontally into the into the wall before coming to a rest so let's say 5.3 and then let's sketch that down so we're moving from point r and then we hit the wall after we hit the wall we move uh, horizontally right uh, that's what the information is saying and then we come to a rest so that is vf here it's zero right and then uh, this um horizontal movement that's 0 0.25 meters and then this height here is 5.8 meters uh, like we already know okay now the question for 5.3 says uh define the term conservative force um a conservative force is a force in which the work done is independent of path uh in our curriculum i uh, the only forces that are conservative is natural forces electrostatic magnetic and a gravitational force all other forces are non-conservative they depend on the path taken so a conservative force is a force in which the work done is independent of path uh, let's move ahead 5.4 says is the force which the wall exists on the ball a conservative or a non-conservative force I already stated for 5.3 that the only conservative forces we have are natural forces. So 
a force that is excited by a wall will thus be non conservative yes uh, let's move to 5.4 5.4 says oh no 5.5 i meant uh, my bad state the energy conversion that takes place during the downward swing of the head demolition ball uh, the downward swing is from uh, r until it hits the wall and then uh, they say we shall ignore friction right uh, let's use uh, mechanical energy uh, we have uh, ep uh, plus ek at the top is equal to ek uh, plus ep at the bottom right at the top uh, it's stationary so ek is zero so we only have ep and then at the bottom uh, we've uh, exhausted the height the height is now zero right so our ek is the only thing we have the ep is zero so the energy conversion is uh, potential energy uh, to kinetic energy right um 5.6 says uh, using energy principle calculate the magnitude of the average force exerted on the ball while it moves into the wall um if you've watched other of my videos um i always say that usually 5.3 helps you answer 5.4 and then 5.4 5.5 so on and so on and so on so let's go ahead and try and apply uh, the same principle to this problem uh, 5.5 we see that uh, at the top we have EP and then at the top we have EK. So if we can determine EP at the top to find EK, then we can find the velocity at the bottom, right? Uh, so here uh, the V is zero. And here the V is the max, right, for that journey. So let's just call it V, let's call it V2, right? So if we use uh, this formula, that we have here ep equals to ek uh, we can determine this velocity right and then maybe we can you know see what we can do with that velocity but then uh, if you pay uh, close attention uh, we have vf uh, we have this v2 here and then we have the distance covered so with that we can calculate uh, the acceleration uh, of that motion right so we, we, we will have the acceleration, we have the mass of the object, and then we can just use F equals to MA to determine the force exerted, right? So, but then to find the acceleration, we first need to use uh, this formula here to find uh, V2. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we have EP equals to EK uh, from from 5.5 so ep is mass multiplied by gravity multiplied by height which is equal to 1 over 2 mv we're calling this 2 right squared so the mass 1250 gravity is 9.8 uh, the height is 5.8 and then 1 over 2 the mass is 1250 and then we have velocity 2 squared um if i i put the left hand side on my calculator i get um i get 70 1050 uh, which is equals to um 1250 divided by 2 uh, that is 625 uh, v2 squared right and then I can solve for V2 squared. So V2 squared uh, will be uh, 71,050 divided by 625. And then take square root on both sides. I'll get uh, V2 equals to, uh, let me put that in the calculator. Um, 71,050 divided by 625. Uh, that is 10.6 six two one meters per second and then i'm gonna use uh, these to find the acceleration for the uh, horizontal uh, movement here all right um i think uh, for clarity i shall drag this down so that 
uh, you can be looking at it while I'm solving it. So, okay, 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 let's see, let's see. Yes, so now we have uh, V, V2. So we're gonna have, um, we have, okay, let's see, we have V2, uh, we have VF, uh, we have delta X, right? And then we need acceleration. Uh, no, this is, yeah, what we need. We need acceleration. So the formula to use here is um, VF squared equals to VI squared plus 2A delta X, right? Uh, VF squared, it comes to rest, so it's zero. VI is um, 10.6621. We squared uh, plus two uh, acceleration is what we are interested in, and then multiply by zero point two five. So we're gonna take this term to the left hand side. Uh, we're gonna get uh, minus ten point six six two one squared equals to zero point five acceleration. I multiply by a. That's two multiplied by zero point two five. So if you uh, make A the subject of the formula, you will get, uh, let me put that in my calculator real quick, um, 10.6621 squared, oh, what's going on here, uh, squared divided by 0 0.5, uh, that is 227.36 um, uh, meters per second squared, right? So now I have my acceleration, I have my mass, and I know I fully well that F equals to MA. So M is 1250. Uh, the acceleration is 2, uh, 27, there's a minus here, uh, 227, uh, point three six, And then if I put that in the calculator, I get, um, let me see, 1250 multiplied by 227.36. I get, um, I get minus 284,200 um, uh, newtons. Um, that's it for this question. Um, I know it looks a bit complicated. Uh, well, it is, so I'd advise you to, uh, Rewatch the video again uh, just to wrap your head around what's going on. Elena in a car moving at a constant speed of uh, 10 meters per second. So we have V equals to uh, 10 meters per second. A long straight horizontal road uh, records the frequency of sound emitted uh, by a distant stationary source. Uh, so the source in this instance is stationary. And the listener is the one in motion, right? Uh, the learner then repeats uh, the recording of the frequency of the sound when the uh, when the car travels at a new constant speed of 20 meters per second. So we have our v a uh, new of uh, 20 uh, meters per second. So to say, the graph uh, below, not drawn to scale, is obtained from the results. Uh, on the y-axis, uh, you can see we have the recorded frequency. And then on the x-axis, we have the speed of the car. So let me uh, sketch what is going on. So this question is saying that um, this sound source is stationary. Uh, what is moving away is uh, the listener, right? On the first scenario, uh, the listener is moving away at a velocity of 10 meters uh, per second and then on the second scenario uh, the sound source still um, stationary uh, but uh, the listener is now moving away at a speed of 20 uh, meters uh, per second uh, the first question says um, uh, state the Doppler effect uh, this is the apparent change in observed frequency as a result of the relative motion between a sound source and an observer. Um, 6.2 uh, 6 says uh, use the graph to answer the following question and then um, 
6.2 that we have it 6.2.1 uh, write down the frequency of the sound source emitted uh, by the stationary uh, source so uh, the equation we have for Doppler effect is that uh, the frequency observed by the listener equals to uh, v plus or minus uh, vl uh, divided by v uh, plus or minus uh, vs uh, multiplied by frequency emitted by source so for us to find uh, the frequency uh, emitted uh, by the sound source uh, using this equation we need the frequency observed by the listener to be equal to the frequency emitted by the sound source um, for us to obtain that using the uh, using this equation uh, we need a VL here the velocity of the listener to be equal to the velocity of the sound source so that V and V can cancel out and then at the end we have FL equals to fs um as far as uh we know uh, the, freak, uh, the 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 velocity of the sound source is zero right because it's stationary so we go to a graph and look at a point where the velocity of the listener or the car is zero so that um the frequency of the listener can be equal to the frequency of the sound source and then if you look at the graph uh there's a green point there i'm making that is where uh, we have zero and the x-axis and then on the y-axis we have uh the frequency uh, which is equal to uh, 700 hertz right so the frequency emitted by the stationary source uh, in this situation is 700 hertz uh, then the question is, and then it goes on to say, uh, give a reason for your answer. Uh, the reason of the answer is that there's no relative motion between source and listener. They all have a velocity. So velocity of listener equals to velocity of source equals to zero meters per second. No relative motion between the two. So the Doppler effect uh, cannot take place or its effect is zero in this instance. Uh, let's move on to the next question 6.2.2 uh, in which direction is the car moving relative to the source choose from towards or away uh, give a reason uh, for the answer again uh, we have to stick uh, to the graph we have uh, that's what the question requires of us so at let's okay if when the velocity uh, is zero uh, the frequency observed is 700 hertz. Uh, when the velocity is 10 meters per second, uh, the frequency observed is 779.1. So it seems like when the speed of the car is increasing, uh, the frequency observed is going down. That only happens when a vehicle is moving away, right? whether the sound source is moving away from the listener or the listener is moving away from the sound source. But then in this situation, we know very well that uh, the sound source is stationary. So the listener is the one moving away. So here uh, we'll write away. And then the reason for that is that uh, the frequency uh, observed is less than uh, the frequency emitted right yes um let's move ahead 6.2.3 uh it says uh, calculate uh, the speed of sound in air okay so what we're going to do uh we have the data for when the speed of the vehicle is 10 meters per second and when the speed of the vehicle is 20 meters per second so we're going to pick one between the two and then we're gonna use it uh, to find our um, the speed of the air so again uh, the first thing to do is to jot down the given information right so now we know that the frequency of the source is 700 hertz so we're gonna write that down uh, the velocity of a is our unknown right and uh, the velocity of the source is zero uh, so the velocity of the listener now 
we have to pick one point uh, between the two. It's either we start with 10 or we start with 20. So let's pick 10. Uh, so there we have it, 10 meters per second. So on our Doppler effect, uh, we're going to have one missing variable, which is the speed of sound in air. And then from that, it's just uh, solving the math. So let's go ahead and do that. We have FL equals to V plus or minus VL divided by V plus or minus Vs uh, multiplied by the frequency of source, right? Um, the frequency observed by the listener uh, when the when the speed of the car is 10 meters per second is 679.1, uh, which is equals to uh, this V is what we are interested in, the speed of sound in M. And then the velocity of the listener, uh, because uh, the listener is moving away, uh, we're supposed to have a minus on the numerator, right? If it was moving towards, then we're going to have a plus. So there we're going to have uh, V uh, minus 10 uh, divided by uh, the, velo the velocity of uh, sound in air and then um, the, the listener stationary. So we're going to have plus or minus zero multiplied by frequency of source. Uh, frequency of source is 700 hertz. So we're just going to have that there. So if we write this nicely, uh, we get 679.1 equals to V uh, minus 10 uh, divided by V multiplied by 700. Um, if I divide both sides uh, by 700, uh, I will get uh, 679.1 uh, divided by 700 uh, equals to V uh, minus 10 uh, divided by V. Uh, cross multiply, I get 679.1 V um, equals to 700 uh, V uh, minus 700 uh, multiplied by 10. Uh, check uh, this uh, value here to the left hand side. I get um, 679.1 V minus 700 V equals to minus uh, 7000, right? Yeah, there we have it. Uh, so now I can take uh, V as a common factor. Uh, that will give me 679.1 minus 700 uh, equals to minus uh, 7000. And then V is thus equals to minus uh, 7000 uh, divided by 679.1 uh, minus 700. Uh, let me put that in my calculator real quick. Um, it's taking a bit longer than I expected. Just give me a sec. So we have minus uh, 7000 uh, divided by uh, 679.1 minus 700. Uh, that is uh, 334. Uh, um, point nine nine three meters uh, per second. So yeah, that is what I'm getting. Um, so what I'll ask you guys to do is to use the other point uh, when the velocity is twenty meters per second, and see if you get the same thing. Um, this is a series of videos. Um, I've done question five, four, three, two from this question paper. So if you click on the channel, uh, you'll get all of that. Uh, please leave a like, subscribe. Point one and uh, says that uh, state Coulomb's law in words. Uh, that is that um, the magnitude of the electrostatic force that one point charge exerts on another point charge is directly proportional to the product of their charges and inversely proportional to the distance between them. Uh, that is basically uh, the formula for electro electrostatic. Uh, you can see that uh, F is directly proportional to the magnitude of the charges and inversely proportional to the square distances uh, between the point charges. Uh, so let's move ahead. Um, 7.2. 7.2 says, uh, calculate the distance R uh, between uh, the spheres. Uh, if you look at the diagram on the left hand side, uh, we have uh, sphere R and uh, sphere S. And then we're supposed to calculate the distance r in between. 
yeah um if you go through the question um i just i didn't go through it in the video just to save you some time uh there it says sphere r um look at the left hand side there i'm just going to highlight it yeah there we have it uh, it says sphere r exists an electrostatic force of magnitude 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3 newtons on sphere s right so if uh, we're using this formula f equals to k uh, q1 uh, q2 uh, divided by r squared uh, we know that f uh, will be 1.2 uh, times 10 uh, to the power of minus 3 uh, equals to then k is a constant uh, that is 9 times 10 to the power 9 and then q1 uh, will be r in this instance so r uh, the charge is 5 uh, times 10 uh, to the minus 9 uh, multiplied by at the charge of sphere s which is um minus six uh, but then on electrostatic force we are only interested on the magnitude so in this instance uh, there's no need to include the sign so it's just gonna be six uh, times ten uh, to the minus nine uh, divided by r squared r squared is what you are interested in so from here it's quite simple uh, the only variable we have is r squared so you just do a bit of math and uh, you solve it also let me go ahead and do that um i'm going to cross multiply uh, i'm going to multiply the left hand side by r and then multiply by the right hand side by r so that will give me um, r squared uh, equals to uh, 9 uh, times 10 to the 9 multiplied by 5 um okay some technical issues 5 times 10 to the minus 9 uh, multiplied by 6 uh, times 10 uh, to the minus 9 divided by uh, 1.2 times 10 uh, to the minus 3 uh, so now what's left is uh, taking the square root on both sides so i'm going to get uh, r uh, equals to 9 times 10 uh, to the 9 uh, multiplied by 5 times 10 to the minus 9 uh, multiplied by 6 times 10 to the minus 9 everything divided by 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 and then uh, to the power 1 over 2 and uh, thus taking the square root uh, equals to uh, let me put that uh, in the calculator real quick and see and see what i get so we have 9 uh, times 10 to the 9 multiplied by 5 times 10 to the minus 9 multiplied by 6 times 10 to the minus 9 to the minus 9 uh, divided by 1.2 um, times 10 to the minus 3 everything to the power 1 divided by 2 uh, that gives me 0 0.015 uh, meters so um, yeah that's the value for r uh, let's move ahead uh, 7.3 7.3 says uh, draw a free body diagram uh, for sphere s okay let me go ahead and do that but then like all the time if you draw a free body diagram for an object you are probably going to use that free body diagram on the question that's going to follow okay so let me go ahead and just uh, draw the free body diagram so uh, this sphere s um i just highlighted in green on the left hand side so on sphere s um they say uh, pulling force from sphere r right so it's being pulled uh, by sphere r because uh, r is uh, of an opposite magnitude uh, to sphere s so it's going to pull it and then it's connected to point p by a by a string so uh, going up uh, we have uh, some tension there and then obviously uh, we have gravity and then um, it's on a surface so because it's on a surface uh, we're going to have um, the normal force and then what else do we have uh, we have the tension we have the weight uh, we have um, the normal force we have uh, the F the force applied by R so I think yeah that's it we're done and then let's move ahead uh, 7.4 7.4.1 7.1 uh 7.4.1 uh, the question says calculate the tension 
um, in the string in the string. So as soon as I think about engine, uh, the first thing I run to is fnet uh, equals to ma. Uh, this is because almost all the time when uh, the question asks me to calculate engine, I use this formula. So I'm starting here and then I can move elsewhere. And then um, if you've watched other of my videos, uh, I recommend that you go watch them. You will know exactly what to do with them. I will go to, okay, we're supposed to find the tension. Um, the spheres are stationary, right? So we know that f net equals to zero. Okay, so let's just uh, put the put that there. So there it is. We have zero because acceleration is zero. Um, so what we're going to do? Uh, we're going to uh, write uh, the biggest force and then subtract all the other uh, small forces. Uh, but you can wonder like which one is the biggest force because uh, it's stationary. So that means that um, all the forces are balancing out. Uh, we have two forces uh, pulling uh, the sphere down the incline and then the tension is pulling it up the incline, right? Uh, the first force is the force being applied by the sphere R and then uh, the force of gravity, gravity parallel to the plane. So those forces are equal to the tension. So the tension is bigger than uh, those two forces. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that. So I'm going to have a uh, tension uh, minus FG uh, parallel uh, minus um, F uh, applied by R, right? Which we are given as 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 Newton. So the tension is our unknown. So there we have it. Uh, so this will, this is going to be, let's take a uh, fg parallel and fr to the other side therefore we're gonna have fg parallel uh, plus f uh, the electrostatic force exerted by r right so this is t equals to fg parallel on an incline we know that uh, that gives us um the mass uh, multiplied by gravity and then a uh, sign of the angle right sine theta uh, plus uh, the, the, that one we are given is it's 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 newton so now um the mass of a uh, sphere s uh if you read through the equation uh, you can see that the mass of sphere s is given as 0 0.01 kg yeah there it is i just covered it then so we have 0 0.01 kg uh, multiply by force of gravity 9,8 uh, sine of uh, there we have the angle 25 degrees uh, plus 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 so let me go ahead and put that in my calculator real quick uh, get um, 0 0.01 uh, multiplied by 9,8 uh, sine of 25 uh, plus 1.2 to the minus three uh, that gives me uh that is that is equal to 0 0.04 or uh, two so that will just be 0 0.04 uh newtons so that's uh, the tension uh, that is uh, between sphere s and point p uh let's move ahead uh, last but not least uh 7.4.2 a uh, net electric field at point P. Uh, we know that the equation for electric field is E equals to K uh, Q uh, divided by R squared or is equals to um, F uh, divided by Q. So we don't, we, so in this question we're going to use uh, this formula E equals to K Q uh, divided by R squared. Uh, instead of uh, this formula here because we don't have uh, the charge of of p right so we cannot use that formula um so let's go ahead and do that but then before we carry on uh one thing to realize is that um s and r have opposing effects uh r is positive so if p is positive it will be getting repelled uh, but then if it's negative, it will be getting uh, pulled. And then uh, sphere S it will do the opposite. 
if it is negative it will attract and then if it is positive it will pull apart so one between we have to put a negative sign uh, between either uh, the electric field for sphere r or the electric field for sphere s right uh, so that will be e net um, equals to e exerted by q uh, plus e exerted by s right um, so okay e net equals to uh, so q uh, no exerted by r i'm sorry uh, said q instead of r so the k we know what k is that's 9 times 10 to the 9 and then q ah and then r the charge for r uh, that is uh, 5 times 10 uh, to the minus 9 uh, divided by r squared okay uh, the distance between r and p is uh, look at the left hand side uh, the sum of uh, this distance and this distance right so it means that here on the denominator we're supposed to have r we calculated it it was a 0 0.015 meters so that is 0 0.015 plus 0 0.03 and then uh, we square that and then plus uh, 9 times 10 uh, to the 9 and then the charge of uh, sphere s minus 6 uh, times 10 uh, minus 9 uh, divided by the the distance is 0 0.03 uh, squared uh, which is equals to uh, let me put that in the calculator real quick and see what I get um, yeah that is giving me a uh, minus uh, 37 uh, 7 7 7 point uh, 7 8 uh, nano per column and then yeah that's it for this question uh, we're done um, so the key key points the things to remember um if you're calculating f using k q1 q2 uh, divided by r squared no need to include the sign of the charges uh, but then if you're calculating uh, the electric field exerted by uh, two point charges on one on another point then that's where you have to use uh, you have to consider the sign right so 8.1 um 8.1 says in the definition of the emf of a battery given below um a and b represent missing words or phrases um and then who's supposed to fill those phrases so that's just the definition of emf uh, the emf of a battery is the maximum electric energy uh, supplied by a battery per unit charge uh, passing through it so yeah this question is just asking you for the definition uh, let's move ahead um we have 8.2 uh okay uh, it says that with switch s uh close uh, the voltmeter is uh, 2.63 V so we have uh, so we have V uh, equals to 2.63 and then uh, the first question says calculate the external um, resistance of the circuit um, if that uh, if that switch is closed then uh, both uh, the, all the resistors in the in that diagram are playing part right uh, the 4 ohm the 3 ohm and the 7 ohm uh, but then the trick is that um the 4 and the 3 are in parallel with the 7 but then the 4 and 3 are in series with each other so what we are going to do is to calculate uh, the sum of uh, the this resistance here right and then after we do that we will then calculate uh, the resistance uh, that is due because of these two parallel uh, resistors so that is a resistor in series uh, will be the 4 ohm uh, plus the 3 ohm uh, which will just give you um, 7 ohm and then then we can have um, 
the resistance in parallel right so in parallel we have one divided by rp uh, equals to one divided by uh, resistor one uh, plus one divided by uh, resistor two blah 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 until resistor n if yeah if we had another resistor here we're going to have a uh, plus one divided by resistor three so uh, what is uh, resistor one resistor one is the resistance uh, that is in series on this line here right uh, the four and the three so that is one divided by seven and then resistors two uh, resistor two is what we have here uh, when the switch s is closed which is seven so that will be one divided by seven so to solve this you just uh, flip you just add the two uh, one divided by seven plus one divided by seven and then you flip so that will be one divided by resistors in parallel equals to uh, keep the same base uh, keep the same denominator and then add the numerators and then if you flip you get rp divided by one equals to uh, seven divided by two which is just three comma five um ohm uh, so the external uh, resistance of this circuit is uh seven seven it's 3.5 ohm uh, if uh, this circuit is oh uh, if this uh this switch here is open and it's not closed and uh, then the resistance was just going to be uh, the sum of these two uh, resistors here um let's move ahead 8.3 uh, 8.3 uh, we start with some information uh, when the switch s is opened uh, we have v equals to eight oh, <laughs> what am i saying equals to 2.8 uh, volts and then 8.3.1 so um when the switch is closed um okay so the switch is closed uh we know that uh the voltmeter reading is 2.63 uh volts and then the the watch uh, we know that v equals to i uh, multiplied by r uh, we know that the resistance uh, when it's closed is uh, 3.5 uh, ohms right and then uh, from this we can write uh, v equals to i uh, multiplied by r okay at uh, this first step uh, we're trying to extract uh, the current right and then after we extract the current uh, we'll see if we're able to find the internal resistance and then if we can't then uh, we'll look for other ways we can do that but let's start from here uh, so the v is 2.63 like i've said and then i is our unknown and then our internal resistance is 3.5 uh, ohms right and then if you uh, divide both sides by uh, 3.5 uh, we get i equals to um 2.63 divided by 3.5 uh, that gives us a uh, 0.75 um, yeah there we have it uh, if you want to calculate um, the only formula in our curriculum uh, that includes uh, internal resistance is E uh, equals to I multiplied by R uh, plus R and then another way of writing this formula is e equals to uh, v external plus i multiplied by r so let's go ahead and substitute it into, into this equation because this is the only equation that has internal resistance as a variable yeah but then we don't know the emf so that is just going to be e equals to um we know uh, v external uh, when the circuit uh, is is closed right it is given as 2.63 uh, and then i we just calculated it that's 0 comma 75 and then we have r so okay let's let me just highlight that there so you can see here that um we we have one equation and then we have two variables so common sense tells you that we have to find another equation so that we have two equations two variables and then we can solve simultaneously so here we looked at the case where uh, the switch is closed uh, to extract another equation so to say we can look at the case where the switch is open so when the switch is open 
the voltmeter reading uh, is said to be 2.8 uh, volts and then the current um, I uh, is unknown and then uh, the resistance is uh, 7 right and yeah, like I said above that if you open the switch then at the resistance you just add uh, the 4 ohm resistor and the uh, 3 ohm resistor there's the 4 ohm resistor there so um, again let's do what we did there v equals to a i multiply by r uh, so i equals to v uh, divided by r r we say that is of uh, v we say that is 2.8 and then r is 7 right here uh, the resistance so that's 2.8 divided by 7 uh, that gives me uh, 0 0.4 ohm so now we know that uh, we jump into this equation i equals to uh, v external uh, plus i r and then from here we don't know what the emf is uh, v external we know the reading is 2.8 and then i is 0 0.4 and then r is our unknown uh, but then in this case uh, we have a second equation and then uh, we have two variables so what we can do uh, we can just say uh okay let's name this e1 and then let's say name this e2 oh e2 <laughs> so we can just say e1 uh, equals to e2 because uh, this is the emf of the same circuit right and then that is uh, e1 is 2.63 uh, um plus 0.75 r uh, which is equals to 2.8 uh, plus 0 0.4 r um okay let's uh, take uh, 2.63 to the right hand side and then we take uh, 0.4 r to the left hand side so that will give you 0 0.7 oh let me change the color of the pen uh, 0 0.7 r minus 0 0.4 r equals to 2.8 uh, minus 2.63 so 0 0.75 uh, minus 0 0.4 uh, that is 0 0.35 uh, which is equals to 2.8 uh, minus 2.63 uh, that is uh, we have r here uh, that is 0 0.17 um, and then let me divide both sides by uh, 0 0.35 0 0.17 divided by 0 0.35 uh, that gives me r equals to 0 0.485 uh, so that will just be uh, 0 0.49 uh, um, ohms 8.3.2 uh, says calculate the emf uh, we know that uh, the internal resistance is equal to 0 0.49 ohms right uh, we just calculated it and then now we have uh, two equations for emf so you just pick one and then you substitute uh, the internal resistance and you get uh, the emf so the first equation says uh, 2.63 uh, plus 0 0.75 r uh, so that that will be 2.63 uh, plus 0 0.75 uh, multiply by 0 0.49 uh, let me see what i get yeah and uh, what i get is uh, right about 3 volts uh, so what i want you to do uh, is to take uh, the second equation and substitute uh, 0 0.49 and see if you get the same thing when light of various frequencies is incident on the metal cathode of a photo cell uh, photoelectrons are emitted from the surface of the cathode. Uh, the graph below shows the relationship between the maximum kinetic energy of an emitted photoelectron and the wavelength of the incident light. Um, 10.1 10.1 says uh, use the graph to determine the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectron. Uh, when the wavelength that is incident is one times 10 to the minus seven meters. Uh, this is quite straightforward. Uh, you can see on the y axis we have uh, the maximum kinetic energy. On the x axis we have the wavelength. 
So it's just a matter of looking for the uh, one times 10 to the minus seven meters, uh, which is uh, right there. I just put a cross and then you draw a line until you cut on the graph. Uh, there it is. Uh, there we have it. Let me change the color. Yeah, there we have it there. And then why, what is the corresponding y value? That's what the uh, question is asking for, uh, the maximum kinetic energy. Uh, so from zero to two, uh, there is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, there's five blocks, right? Uh, so two divided by five, uh, this is 0 0.4. For, for every, uh, for every, block is zero point is a 0 0.4 jump uh, in maximum kinetic energy so there we have starting at 10 uh, it will be 10.4 10 10.8 10 uh, 11.2 11.6 uh, so the corresponding uh, kinetic energy is 11.6 uh, uh, times 10 uh, to the minus 19 uh, joules uh, so that's the answer for 10.1 uh, 10.2 says uh, what relationship uh, between the maximum kinetic energy of the em emitted uh, photoelectron and the wavelength of the incident light can be deduced uh, from uh, the graph uh, from the graph you can see that uh, from 0 0.5 and then you go to 1 you go to uh, 1.5 uh, for the wavelength as the wavelength uh, increases uh, the maximum kinetic energy uh, is going down so from the graph we can deduce that uh, as the wavelength of uh, the incident light increases uh, the corresponding maximum kinetic energy uh, goes down and then um, we move ahead 10.3 10.3 says uh, define uh, the term uh, work function in words uh, that is uh, the minimum energy uh, needed to release an electron from a metal surface the minimum energy uh, needed to remove or release an electron from a metal surface uh, usually if you define something uh, on the question that follows you are going to use uh, that definition so let's uh, move ahead 10.4 10.4 says uh, use the graph to calculate the work function of the metal used as a cathode uh, in this photo cell uh, like i said we define work function and now we have to calculate it so basically if you were able to define work function and then you just didn't memorize the definition you actually understand it then that becomes uh, very easy to, to sort of um to sort of, to sort of answer the equation so uh let's go back to the equation we have an equation that says uh, the energy is given by uh, the work function uh, plus uh, the maximum kinetic energy uh, but then if you keep on decreasing uh, the maximum kinetic energy you reach a point where the energy is equal to the uh, work function so here you have ek being equal to zero uh, if you look at our graph um, at this point here at this point here uh, look at it I uh, just highlighted it in blue uh, that is where uh, the kinetic energy is equal to zero. So the wavelength at that point uh, is the wavelength of the work function. Uh, so if we have work, uh, if we have the wave uh, uh, the wavelength, then we can calculate uh, the work function as um, the constant h and then speed of light uh, divided by uh, the threshold uh, wavelength, so to say. Uh, so let's look at uh, the number of let's look at how uh, the wavelength is changing per every block and then we can see how we move so we have one two three four five we have five blocks so uh, one block it will be 4.6 and then that seems like is uh, the block before last so that is going to be um, the threshold um, wavelength will be 4.9 uh, uh, times 10 
uh, to the power minus seven uh, meters. So from there on, uh, the work function uh, equals to 6.63. Uh, this is a constant uh, minus 34 uh, multiplied by speed of light, three times 10 uh, to the power of eight uh, divided by the threshold uh, wavelength uh, 4.9 times 10 uh, to the minus seven. Uh, let me just put that in the calculator real quick. Uh, we have 6.63 uh, times 10 to the minus 34 uh, multiplied by speed of light. And then we divide all of that by 4.9 uh, times 10 to the, uh, to the minus 7. And uh, that gives me uh, 4 uh, point, 4 point what? 4.06. Uh, times 10 to the minus 19 uh, joules. So for this question, uh, that's how you determine um, the the work function. Uh, this question are usually not really complicated. Uh, you're given a graph or sometimes you're not and then you just interpret it and then from there it becomes easy. So let's move ahead. 10.5 uh, 10.5 is I can create the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectron uh, when the wavelength of the incident light is uh, 0 0.5 times 10 minus 7 meters. So uh, we know that we have E, uh, which is uh, the energy equals to the work function uh, plus E k max. Uh, this equation wants us to find the maximum kinetic energy. So this is what we are interested in. Uh, so from this equation, uh, EK max, maximum kinetic energy, uh, is given by the energy minus the um, work function. We calculated the work function from the above uh, equation. Uh, now uh, what we have to do is to find uh, this energy here. And then the difference between the two will be our kinetic energy. Uh, we're given the wavelength for that as uh, 0.5 times 10 to the minus 7. Uh, this is so this will be uh, h uh, multiplied by speed of light. Uh, that's our uh, that's our wavelength there. 4.0 oh minus here yeah, not equals to minus uh, 4.06 uh, multiplied by 10. Uh, to the minus 19. So here we're going to have 6.63 uh, times 10 to the minus 34 uh, multiplied by the speed of light uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, divided by the wavelength. The wavelength is given as 0 0.5 uh, times 10 uh, minus 7 and then you subtract uh, the work function. So that is 4.06 uh, times 10 uh, minus 19. Uh, let me put that into uh, my calculator real quick and and see what I get. So that is uh, 6.63 uh, to the minus 34 multiplied by speed of light again. We divide it by 0 0.5 this time. Uh, multiplied by minus 7 and then minus 4.06 uh, to the minus uh, 19. And then when I put that in my calculator, I'm getting... Uh, 357 uh, point, uh, point 0.2 uh, multiplied by 10 uh, to the minus 20 uh, is kinetic energy so the SLI unit is joules uh, so yeah uh, there we have it uh, that's the answer for the last question